Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. But this is this is a good example of some of the things that kind of can keep you and I up at night when we're thinking about teaching right. uh, this this group of men is because we know there are different views out there and there yeah. are men who have very strong views and uh, um, sometimes I don't know about you but I get nervous yeah. because um, I mean I want to be faithful to teaching God's word but I also um want to be humble enough to to say you know there are different yeah. different acceptable views out there i think the main things are the plain things right yeah so the gospel is the main thing because you have even in chapter 14 you have these verses like what about verse 34 the women right that's controversial in the churches yeah uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to get ready for that one. There's actually uh Keller SM talks about that. What does that mean? What does that mean for today? So I'm going to do some more research on that one. Um, there, there, there's, there's that cultural at the time. This is the way he was dealing with gender issues at his time. And so does that, uh, but it is scripture. So does that mean it's timeless? Right. Right. Um, uh, anyway, I mean, so. verse 35 is pretty strong too, you know, if there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Wow. Yeah, and I'd heard, I'd heard once, though, that they were like, he was dealing with women, they were like uh, outbursts in the church and just, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, arguing or... Well, because the whole thing is about being orderly in the church service. So argumentative or arguing or outbursts or... And, he's, and so he was trying to deal with that. And um, it was a, a cultural problem for the moment. But I don't know. Uh, so get to get into different views on that one too. But I, I think part part of what I so we do these kind of studies. There's always oftentimes and they say I've got four chapters to talk about, and we do the Old Testament. We say here's half a book or a whole book to talk about. Right. And within this portion of scripture, there's one little nugget that is super controversial that people would love to sink their teeth into and read. Right. Oh, I got views on that. I want to talk about that. What about this? And I'm you know the church is not a big warning to the church today, and I want someone wants to get in there course and this is kind of one of those it's like a little bit of a spark that could light a argumentative fire and so i'm not you know in, usually with those i'm inclined to as a lot of them are non-essentials like you said i'm inclined to like yeah okay there's different yeah. views let's move on to i'll tell well, you one thing you talk about that just say just we talk about essentials what you and i talk about in this podcast a lot is that notion of sanctification through the gospel of race-based sanctification not works-based sanctification yeah that's changed your life i know in my life i talk about it in terms of that illustration i always talk about i'm gripped by that that's when i felt born again again that's why i feel like i'll go to i'll go to task on that i feel like that's a that's a that's so life-changing and i I don't don't think you and i think you could be saved and not understand that at all but i think it's so important that's when i go to the map for well, and I think that's why we do this podcast is because we we do think that it's it's so it's such a neglected um people it's it's not taught it's not taught like no sanctification in general um the the general uh way it, it seems to be taught in the church is that it's through your hard work and effort and you Always. kind of just go right back to your default setting. It's religiosity. Yeah. That's right. Which That's is right. such yeah. a which is such a shame because um, you know, the gospel has the power to change your life. Right. Um, you know, to bring you to to bring you to God for your salvation. Why wouldn't it have the power to change to to sanctify you? You know, you're right. That's interesting. The way you just said it, it's only that people doubt the power of the gospel to say it's not the if I just tell you the gospel, if I told you that God accepted you 100 percent completely, 100 percent fully complete, there's nothing you could do to be more accepted by God than you already are. 
then you know you'll just it's license you 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 won't you won't obey you won't climb the single line you won't as we in our that to use that term yeah, you'll just live however you want you live however you want not right? really no if you really understand it that's right but I don't think the gospel is powerful enough to do that. It's unless I give you tips and pointers, unless I really get you to really use guilt and shame to make you grit your teeth and put forth more effort. You won't do it. You won't do it. The gospel is not powerful enough. I doubt the power. That's really great, Craig. I never I thought about those terms. I doubt the power of the gospel to do it. Then, if I, that's that's the approach I take. Yeah. So, so um, let's let's jump to chapter yeah, fifteen. Yeah, fifteen. This is to this because this why, kind of. Why do you think he switches? What What do you think? He, it's interesting. Like, do you see any? Do you have any ideas on like the transition? Yeah, the transition from fourteen to to fifteen. I don't. Other than if he said, "I got a list of things I need to talk to you about," like you know, spiritual gifts and uh, the orderliness of the service and food and the resurrection. And this is on my list. I got you. Got five big problems. I got to hit all five. Because you're right. He just verse fifteen says, "Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you." which you received and which you take and on which you take your stand by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. And then he goes on and talks about the resurrection and how important the resurrection is. Um, and the, you know, and apparently people were saying there is no resurrection of the dead. This life is all there is. And, um, and I, I gotta be clear on this, Greg, I'm not sure the people that he's, if he's arguing against people that were saying, Christ himself was not raised from the dead, or if he's just arguing against people that, that were saying no one is raised from the dead, that this there is no resurrection of the dead, not for not only for Jesus, but for none of us, that this life is all there is. Hmm. Because he, he seems to be saying, I mean, clearly, like it seems to me like, on its face. Are you like thinking of saying, like verse 16 here where he says, For if if the dead are not raised, not even right. Christ has been raised. I think he's doing, I think it's both because, and even before that, in the first couple verses of chapter 15, he's talking about, look, let me tell you, like verse four, he was buried. He was raised on the third day. According to the scriptures, he appeared to Cephas, Cephas, Paul, uh, Peter, and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than five. So he's making arguments for the bodily resurrection of Jesus, right? Yeah. You know, and then he talks later about, look, if we're not raised from the dead, there's, Christianity has no point. Like, there's, there's an afterlife. There's a, you know, um, you're going to have a, a a resurrected body in the new kingdom. Mm. I like what Paul says here um, about his credentials in in verse nine. For I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy yeah. to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. See, yeah. now I see that as a gospel driven sanctification verse right there. Oh, that's great. You're absolutely right. He's, and, and and by the way, the, the double lines where he's talking about, Paul's on his lower line. You know, he realizes the depths of his the own worst sin. of sinners. This is this is similar to that peccator. This is Paul saying, I realize in, in my own flesh, right now I'm a zero. I'm not a nine out of ten. I'm not a seven out of ten. I'm a zero. But in his eyes, I'm a ten. I shouldn't even be an apostle. Nope. I shouldn't even I I I bring nothing to the table. I'm not earning anything. I'm not right. But my standing in him is yet by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace given you is not without effect. In his eyes, I'm a ten at the same time justified sinner but i like this where he says on the contrary i worked harder than any of them why what, what was driving him to work harder than any gratitude. Of them? gratitude 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 it was <laughs> gratitude it was power of the gospel right like yeah. he says like the, 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 the power of the gospel is that they, they just like it's 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 not do it's done right like when you you told me that once and I know the you grace, got else. He says it's but the grace of God that is with me. Yeah. The grace of God that is with me. Turns duty into choice. Yeah. Right? It's not that I have to. I I get to. I want to. Got a massive gratitude. I worked I worked harder than all of them. That's his dotted line, right? That's his 
that's yeah. his reaction and his response and his life changing, right? But his focus is still on the grace that God gave him, not in his own spiritual performance. Yeah, that's that's really good. I might really focus on these verses. That's really good, Greg. But then he does go on and he talks about the the resurrection and the resurrected body, which is uh, um, something that's pretty cool to think about. Um, how you know we're all going to be given a new body? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I actually in one of the talks I gave before, I mentioned and referred to some of this. So I might. But I might bring that up again because this is a long passage and one of the few that really talks about what is it like. And it starts out that way in verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? And, and you know, the biggest and best example we have of what it's like to have a glorified body is the risen Christ when he came back. Yeah. Right? He had his, he had his glorified he had a body. Solid, he had a solid body. More solid than the walls around him. That's why he could walk, you know, through walls, right? Yeah. So and he, but he ate food. Ate food, right? And he said, "Touch my, put your Thomas, put your hands at my side. Touch my hand, like my hands." So he, you're right, physical. A it physical is interesting. Body. He had, you know, he had the scars, and yeah. there's that idea that that the only person in heaven that will have scars is Jesus. Oh, I hope so. I hope that's the meaning, and not like that. Because he had scars, therefore you will still have this. Because I mean, I think say that you'll still have the scars, but they won't. They'll be poignant. They'll be meaningful. Yes, you have the scars, but they won't be painful memories. They'll all be like because God's going to turn all that sadness into joy. So I think it would make sense. I mean, when you think of just you know the the focus of the gospel itself, like I mean that he that he would be the only one who would have scars in heaven because that. it's a constant reminder of the cross. Yeah. And and of the gospel. I and, can see that. And even in, in heaven, we can rejoice and and uh worship worship him for what he's done for us, for how much he loved us. Yeah. But this it's so he uses some poetic language. He talks about, you know, in verse 40, there's their heavenly bodies, earthly bodies. The splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. The splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun is one kind of splendor. The moon is and as another. The stars another. So he's talking about physical properties of different celestial bodies, you know. And um, and he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42, the body is sown perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, like our earthly body now. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So, like, there's a transformation, like a physical transformation, like a metamorphosis. So you get a new, and so maybe us need to spend more time in this section in the in the study, Greg, because this is it's a it's usually hopeful section. Now, what is it going to be like? You know, and to have a we won't have won't be just you know uh, angelic like beings with you know the bodies you could see through that flow through the clouds, you know, doing endless choir practice, you know, um, in heaven, like you have a physical body, eating fish, drinking wine. Jesus said, I'm not going to drink this wine until I drink it with you in my kingdom. Right. So like eating and drinking. And Jesus had different physical properties. They didn't recognize him at first. Right. They said, you know, he was like, not, uh, not exactly looked the same like in the Garden of Gethsemane when Mary sees him, she doesn't recognize him at first. Right. So that's why I always say in the next life, I'm going to be six feet tall, Greg. <laughs> well, is it possible that she didn't recognize him because he looked like he was 25 and she only knew him when he was, you know, like 33? Looked... <laughs> so it's not that much. I always wonder about that too. Like, are we all going to look like, you know, uh, are we all going to look like we're you know, is everybody in heaven going to be like 25 years old? Like where we're, we have our, our, you know, best body, you know, who knows? Who knows? And, who and knows? then that'll be weird. Cause then it's like, my dad will be like 20, like, yeah, he's going to look the same age as me. Um, but Here, um, here's a, here's a really weird thought. I don't think this is sound theology, so I don't want to say heresy or anything, but Jesus got his, Jesus was born into this world as a baby. Do you think our souls come back in this world and the glorified heaven and earth being born into it? As the earth like repopulates with this this spirit the spirits of Christians who are asleep? Yeah, I've never heard that. 
Um, I know that would be complete, like complete heresy. No, no, no. We have the the uh, rapture where we meet him in the air, and there's you know different all of these eschatology. And I actually don't want to get into any eschatology and time views because that's another rabbit hole um, that we can go down. But I think the yeah. the notion that you will have a resurrected real body, like especially. You get older and your knees start to go out and you get older and you start having any health problems at all. Right. Right. And you realize that there's the joy of saying, wait, I'm going to have a completely new, my software, my soul is going to be put onto new hardware, right? A new glorified body, hopefully one with a six pack abs. <laughs> yeah. I, I like verses 47 and, and following from there. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As a, as was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Mm. Like So I think you're right when it comes to describing what the resurrection body is going to look like. The best example of it. It isn't even Lazarus who Jesus rose from the dead. It's it's right. Jesus himself. No, and, and Lazarus got could, his natural body back. And, right? Yeah, and how uh, and I love you brought up the fact that he could walk through doors. Right. Um cuz that's a pretty that's pretty amazing. Um well, that is yeah, and I don't know how far to go into this, but so Jesus had his resurrection glorified body. His physical properties had been renewed nude and you know so you get a glimpse of what that's like but the door hadn't been redeemed yet the door hasn't been changed right so that's that still has this world's current physical properties so i think so that the addition he was the, okay so the door was limited to three dimensions mm -hmm. when he was resurrected maybe he lived in a five-dimensional world right where doors were you know you could pass through them well, yeah, or you could just like a three-dimensional person can look at a two-dimensional line and move in and out of it. So some of the more multiple dimensions could do that. Um, uh, yes, I, I read that somewhere, like a very multi-dimensional view of God. Um, I think maybe C.S. Lewis talks about that. Some theologians talk about that, what that's like. Because that allows God to move in and out of time as well, right? Yeah. You know, so. Um, but yeah, they, but the notion of like, um, especially N.T. Wright uh, is a strong proponent of this, and he speaks and writes about this a lot. Like the heaven and earth will all go undergo; everything will be changed. New heaven and new earth means everything gets redeemed. Um, Keller taught this too. That is, yeah. you know, that the door will be redeemed. It'll have it'll have new physical properties. Uh, it'll look like just like the old door. Maybe it'll be look mostly like the door. <laughs> Maybe it'll look a little different, but it'll have everything in a blink of an eye will be changed. The whole, all of creation will be redeemed. That will so. be pretty awesome. Hey, let's bring yeah. this to a close. So chapter 16 just kind of has some random yeah. notes from Paul, final instructions, stuff like that. Let me ask you this, Jim, just to, to close this, close off our podcast for, for uh, this time. Um, yeah. What, what are you thinking are the, the big themes that you want to focus on? Like, as you think about these chapters. Um. Are there are no. there two or three things you think that that you think um, I really want to explore that or I think as I think about it I want to consistently teach in in this study and other forms any anywhere I am always bringing the gospel in always bringing the gospel back especially this misunderstood view of gospel's role in sanctification that we talk about a lot, a lot. yeah so I think I could just you could just do a quick outline of 13, 14, 15. I'll probably leave 16, but 13, 14, 15 talk about love, spiritual gifts, resurrection, resurrection body, and just teach it like a like a kind of a dry course, but to say what is the what's the kind of the, the the gospel view of that? And we've done a little bit in this conversation now, like the gospel coming through with our inability to love the way God sets the standard of real love and how Jesus loved us despite that. He's the only one who really loved, right? To constantly go back to the gospel, um, that's that's what I would want to bring out. So, any but you, you asked me that question. Do you have any thoughts? And you say whatever you whatever you do, Jim, make sure you bring this out. Is that did you have something in mind? No, I didn't. I didn't have anything in mind. I think that um, 
I think you're, I think you're right. Like, um, I mean, um, definitely chapter 13 is, is powerful. I liked your, I liked the way you were viewing it because so many people, sometimes the scripture is so familiar that we don't, um, we don't realize the shocking nature of it. It's kind of like right. the Sermon on the Mount, like, blessed are the, those who are poor and like, you know, you can read the Sermon on the Mount and be like, oh, that's really, that's really nice, you yeah. know, but, yeah. um, but if you really understand it, it's like you said, it's frightening. Greg, I want to tell you, we wrap up with this. Uh, I was at a reunion yesterday for a Bible study I was in like 15, 20 years ago. And one of the guys there, I got to see him again. And um, he's actually who I was uh, just texting right before the study, uh, before this recording. And, um, and I remember I, I saw him again yesterday and I said, I, I, remember, I said, I remember your testimony, the way you came to Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, that's right. I read the Sermon on the Mount. I wasn't a believer. I read the Sermon on the Mount. And I realized, oh my God, if this is his high holy standard, if this is what he really is asking me, it's not just the actions, it's the intent of my heart. There's no way I have fallen so far short of this. I need a savior. And he came to Christ through the reading of the Sermon on the Mount. It's an amazing testimony. It's a beautiful testimony. Yeah. But so it's, it's just echoing and affirming everything you're just saying. You know, you read it, you get inoculated to it. You seem so familiar. Oh, bless the poor in spirit and all that kind of stuff. And if I have not love, I'm like a noisy gong or a clangy symbol. And you can, and you say, wow, what? Yeah, I, I I love your approach, and I hope you kind of go there with with uh, chapter thirteen with the idea of who who can love like this. Who we we should read this and we should read this and fall to our knees and be in dis, be in despair. Yeah, be in yeah. Ex well, that is exactly right. If I and look, if I have to sanctify myself through my hard work and effort. If I say Jesus gets you into heaven, now the rest is up to you. Jesus gave you a fresh start. He gives you salvation, but to be a good Christian, it's all your hard work and effort. The only appropriate response is total despair. That's what Luther did. Like, he, I, like that's it. I, there's, there's no way. There's no way. Um, like, a, uh, I feel like echoing Paul. Like, I'm of all men most to be pitied. There's just, there's, you know. And if you, if you don't, if you're not having that, they don't have reaction. You have dumbed it down. You've made it achievable. You say, oh yeah, I can be patient. Oh yeah, I could, I could, you know, I could be completely other, other centered. Sure, you're just fooling yourself. So praise the Lord for the gospel that say the wretches like you and me, Greg. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail dot com. Stay tuned for our next episode, and remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.